after uh, the, the more formalized session in the command, uh, approaching the EAU counselor or the psychologist on the side afterwards to talk about some personal experience. So we, we saw that happening very organically uh, in small numbers. So imagine if we had a cadre of people dedicated to that full time, you know, not only could we, and, and, and you know, by addressing some of the stresses of policing like PTSD and anxiety, not only could we hopefully impact and reduce the number of suicides, uh, but, but also reduce the stress that cops carry with them every day and then make them better able to serve the public. And I would say this whole thing is analogous to neighborhood policing. So the core principle of neighborhood policing is building trust by developing personal relationships between cops and community uh, all over the city. This is no different. This is internal neighborhood policing uh, where we're developing trust between members of the service and the support staff that can help them cope with their issues but also make them better cops. And, and I would just add to that, uh, you know, the, the whole reason for the executive level training, we started with the executives in the department was to Matt's point, to create Put your mic closer, Commissioner. To, to create an environment, sorry, to create an environment where, uh, where, you know, it's just like, because Matt referenced neighborhood policing, when we started down this path of neighborhood policing, the first people we spoke with and, and made sure that they understood what the mission was and where we were going were the executives. If you don't have this top-down underst you know, uh, understanding from the top, from the very beginning of whatever the initiative, the effort is, then you lose, you lose, you, you, there's diminishing returns. And so the executive training was designed to make sure that, that, that these executives, all 800 plus uh, uniform and civilian, understand, first of all, the urgency and the seriousness with which we're taking this issue, uh, but also the, how critical their role is in, in ensuring and reinforcing and setting a tone that allows for this to happen, as Matt said, organically almost. That, that you, if you have uh, a commanding officer of a precinct or a transit dis district or a PSA uh, uh, who is open and understands the challenges and recognizes that an officer needs some assistance, uh, we'll make sure that that, that environment is conducive to, to getting the help for that person that, that is needed. And that means conversations, it means speaking with the lieutenant or the sergeant, making sure his bosses or her bosses beneath them who are closest to the command staff, uh, to, to the uh, officers at the, at the lowest levels of the organization understand uh, the, the, that this is important to the, to the, to the well-being of the agency overall. All righty, I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Ayala for questions, but can you, Speak to me as if I'm an officer struggling at this moment and tell me why I should trust you and trust this. And don't give the academic answer, but well, why I, should I trust you if I'm an officer through this process? Well, I mean, I, listen, I think it's case by case. I mean, I've, in my career, I've, I've spoken to other officers who I thought needed some challenges. I could speak with one, one individual in particular who came to my command, who came there with an issue and, and, and challenges. And we had conversations. Um, you know, I was an anti-crime cop. He was, he was, they wouldn't, he wasn't on the street. He was, he was really assigned, uh, a modified assignment in the station house. But, but I think, but he spoke to me. He talked to me about, you know, just because I didn't treat him like a pariah, you know, it, it, it's the police culture. I mean, the, the commands are structured. Uh, if you're not, if you're not one of the people who are part of that command, sometimes you're not really accepted. So I think it all depends on, and I think the conversation can be very different, and, and it may just be a word or two. It may just be that, that this person trusts you uh, immediately. I don't think there's a, there's a particular formula. Uh, you know, we're all human beings, and so we react differently to different uh, stimulus, and so stimuli. So it may be um, just the fact that, that someone is available, offers you uh, uh, some information or suggests something to you, you'll either accept it or you won't. Um, but I think that's really what we're trying to do is to build this, this, this environment, this culture that, that says it's okay to seek help. And you can seek that help in any way you think you're comfortable with seeking it. Thank you, Chair Ayala. I wanna recognize that we've been joined by Council Member Alika Anthony Samuel. Um, so I guess I, I'll start off with the first question with, I mean, police officers, um, first responders are, ha have been affected by uh, these type of stressors 
routinely throughout their careers. So that's not new. Do you, does it, has the police department or, um, I mean, studied, is there a trend? Is something changed this year that has contributed to such a high uh, rate of, of such, a, such a huge increase in the number of suicides? In what makes this year different than last? Yeah, I, listen, I, it's hard to tell, and I don't think we know, uh, and I don't think we'll ever know um, what, the, what, what, ha what happened if there was a particular event. I, don't, I suspect there hasn't been. Um, you know, uh, I've been asked in the past when we started this conversation a, a couple of months ago about that, that same issue, a slightly different question, but it's the same, mm -hmm. I think, uh, import, which is, is there any, between those nine individuals who took their lives, what's the, what's the, what's the common thread? And there, there really was no common thread other than the end, which is that they took their own lives. And, and the reasons how, it, how they got there are very different stories. And, and we don't know all the facts. We, we perhaps never will, because only that person knows why they, why, how they got to that point. And um, I think our goal is to really not think about the end game with respect to the result, which is the suicide, but to really think about how do we really impact um, the, the culture and provide services and encourage people to take advantage of, of as many services as we have and make sure that those services are the right did types any, of services. Did any, were, did any of the officers that committed suicide this year attempt to be connected to any of these services? Well, some have, some were, some were in counseling at the time, and so, but that's not always the case. Now, I can't help but, no, but notice the, uh, the fact that most of the, the, the suicides were um, males um, that were impacted. Is the, the type of service that, that's rendered or available for male officers different than that of female officers? No, I, I don't think, we, ma we don't make a distinction uh, by gender or any other, any other uh, criterion otherwise, other than being a member of this department who needs help, whoever you are. So no, it, there's, there's no, there's nothing that we can point to that suggests that, yeah. that that's, a, that's an issue or a challenge or a problem. I mean, I say it because my mother always said that I speak too much, but I think one of the benefits of, of speaking too much is that for women primarily, we are better able to process and articulate because we do speak so much. We're a little bit freer, right? And, and really um, addressing what you know we're feeling at the moment and we don't have a problem really articulating that. For men, sometimes it becomes a little bit you know, harder to do that, and I wonder if there's some sort of, you know, correlation. Should we be treating, you know, it differently? Should it be? Should we be looking at that at it from that lens? Yeah, we, we had a com we had a conference, um, um, in per April. Perk in April. Uh, we, we had a one day conference at, at one police plaza where we had three hundred three hundred uh, people who were clinicians, researchers, medical doctors, uh, you know. EAU type people who provide services and peer counseling and so forth. I mean, a, a broad range of, of people. So, the, so the, as you can imagine, the conversations that took place were pretty rich. And this was part of that conversation, I think, this question. And, and I don't think we're any different. Matt just suggested to me, reminded me that, that we're, we're, we kind of track the national trend with respect to the number of suicides and the fact that, that you know, males uh, may be most common versus females. Uh, so, so sometimes it just is understanding the larger picture may give us some insights as to maybe there's some other things we might do, or sometimes we learn some things and hope to learn things from the, 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 the autopsies that I, uh, I mentioned and referenced earlier. Um, I think we, this is, as I see it, you know, with, with the help of the clinicians, with our psychologists, and, and figuring, out, figuring out how to get rid of the stigma it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress, and we think that everything that we're, you know, this path that we've taken, based on our best information and evidence and research, that we are on the right track. Um, and, and, you know, we hope to learn as we go. Uh, as I said, you know, we, we're looking at the, the immediate aftermath and, um, and, and the information that we get from the investigation that's conducted by our force investigators, uh, force investigation division uh, folks. Uh, but then also sharing that information with our psychologists and, and sort of having a conversation about what we learned. Because you get different, you know, you, when they respond, uh, the investigators respond, they may interview family members, or neighbors, or a variety of, of, of people who give them information. Uh, 
And then uh, that information uh, right now, it may not be directly related to, uh, to understanding why, but sometimes it is. Sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes they make statements. Sometimes they, they may tell you that this, this, that so-and-so had problems. Or in some of these cases, it was pretty clear. Sometimes there's a note, so you get some insight from that. So there's lots of ways in which the information comes in, and then we process that information to figure out and help us understand uh, how to how to deal with uh, uh, and maybe maybe change our policies or, or, or do what we think is necessary. Um, but I do think that we have uh, a baseline that 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 really says to us that we really are. Um, at the very beginning of this process, understanding that we need to figure out ways to connect with our officers as quickly as possible when they're, when they're in distress, whatever that distress looks like. And, and we have a number of things in, in, in place, as, as you heard in my opening testimony, that, that are really a solid foundation. We now know that we can add to it in order to be more effective at the services that we provide and how we provide those services. Were any of the, uh, the, the officers that were still on duty um, on modified duty at the time of their deaths? Well, I, I don't have the specifics, and so I couldn't, I couldn't tell you uh, uh, really, and, and, and I don't remember, so I'm not going to try and, and mention it off the top of my head. Uh, and I don't know that we have that information available. Not with us. Not with us, right? Yep. One? Ah, so Can you come up and so this put is, a record? Oh. Yeah. It, yeah. Speak on the record. Just state your name and title, please. Uh, Inspector Nicole Papamichael, Commanding Officer Medical. We had one officer on restricted duty. He was actually seeing our psychologist, uh, and he wound up ha hanging himself. That's it. So I wonder. I, I had a. I have a friend who who's a police officer, and I remember. When she joined the uh, the department many years ago, how stressed she was. Uh, I was her exercise partner um, at that time many years ago, but I remember her sharing how stressful the process for undergoing the psychological evaluation portion of entering the police force was. Um, it, it put her under you know intense uh, stress. She passed. You know, she was, uh, she, she's, she's actually, you know, um, active as we speak, but when, I, when an officer has to go through that type of process to get, to get in, I would imagine that it would make it, there would be a, little, a lot more reluctant to, to want to, you know, um, proactively seek help because it is a stigma that is attached to them. So I wonder when we, you know, when, a, when an officer has been um, assigned to desk duty, um, do we do them a further disservice because I mean, what is the confidentiality? Are they then signaled out by their, you know, colleagues? Does everybody know now that this person, you know, like how does that how does that contribute to the state of mind of an individual that may be going through something traumatic, something stressful at the moment, um, once they're assigned, right? Uh, well, uh, I, well, you asking kind of a couple. You you made a comment that I just want to just address in, mm -hmm. in terms of your friend. And, and, and coming into the job. I think that the lion's share of people who become police officers go through that process. And it is, it can be stressful, individually stressful, um, but not to the point, I think, where, you know, because if you may discover as you go through it, and if there are some candidates who don't make it through the process for whatever the reasons are, uh, and we don't necessarily always know that. So, uh, but coming in, that's just a process. And so the norm is, 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 is you take it, you go through, you answer the questions, you, you had to take the exam and all of that. So it's, I think that's a little bit separate. I, that's a separate issue from what happens afterwards, perhaps, um, down the road. And, and um, so that's- I don't think so, because I mean, if, if so much emphasis is put in on the psychological part of it, and now you're experiencing some sort of trauma and you have to admit publicly that you're, you know, you may be going through something psychological, that you may be a little bit reluctant to do that if you think oh, yeah. that it'll cast some sort of, you know, light on you, on an unwanted attention, you know? Well, listen, we, we have, we, it, it, the, the, it's, it may come up in a disciplinary fashion, it, you know, because of, and related to some particular violation that the officer is, is committed. Um, May, may come up in that context. Discipline is, is, is certainly stressful, uh, and so we have to deal with that as, as we go. And, and we do 
to the extent that we discover that an individual who's being disciplined is just like in any other one of these cases is is in need of some assistance we'll provide it uh, but you know and interestingly enough I think when it comes to discipline to our process uh, people know that they're going to be held accountable you have rules and regulations and, and so forth uh, but even in in the way in which we've dealt with discipline over these past several years we've we've eased I think some of the stress and angst just as an example of officers who in the past may have been the subject of a lawsuit and, and, and never knew the outcome of that lawsuit because the suits may have been settled um, um, and, and they, no one ever told them that they were part of the lawsuit. And, and we, a lot, we, our officers get sued uh, frequently. Um, but that creates stress. And so what we've tried to do in, over the, you know, the past several years is, and, and the chief mentioned it a moment ago, we have to build trust with the community through the neighborhood policing piece and we understand we have to win back the, the, the community's trust um, and the way in which we do business with them and, 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 and how our officers conduct themselves. But we also have to build trust inside the agency, um, which is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a you know, paramilitary organization, but uh, sometimes in, in, in the past, the discipline has been really heavy handed. And the question is, you know, how do so, we. So, so an officer wouldn't know if you're on death duty because of, it was a disciplinary uh, case versus a mental health evaluation that maybe determined you to need to be in need of, because I think it's, you're, you're force, it forces people to disclose, right, that they're having an issue. Whether you're saying it or not, it's, it's you're forcing a situation where people now know. I, if I'm going to a psychiatrist because I, I'm suffering from depression, I don't want, you know, my, I, I may not want my colleagues to know. I may, I may be okay with that. I may, you well, know. Well, but that wouldn't be general knowledge necessarily. Right? Would it be I mean, we implied? I mean, we should ask, you know. I think I can. So, so I, you know. I don't think, I'm not, I'm not trying to imply that this is like a pur purposeful thing, but I'm just trying to say sometimes we don't look at things from this angle, right? Is that, is, is that, would that, would that contribute? No, you, you, I think you, if we put someone on modified assignment, that, that wouldn't necessarily be a flag that other than maybe there was some, they're being looked at for some particular reason. Modified assignment is not, not a punishment. Right. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is. It is. It is. a way in which we can we can we make a judgment call about whether this person should continue in their whatever their initial assignment was for for a particular reason. Uh, but it doesn't flag that somehow this person has any kind of psychological problem or wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't be public. No one would know even if they are going to counseling or involved in counseling if it was a domestic violence case or whatever. That, that wouldn't necessarily be known. Uh, okay. So, um, so I'm not sure. I, you know, I think, I think it again is case by case by case, and we don't publicize uh, f for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, some of this stuff is, is just confidential. Those conversations that take place, that they're seeing a psychologist or whatever it is. Uh, that's one of the things that we worry about is making sure that people are comfortable getting help and they're not refusing. Uh, 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 feel like they have to re refuse to take get help because they are they're afraid that they will be you know seen as weak or whatever it may it may be by their is by is their there do you have a, a, mand a mandatory reporting um, requirement so that if an officer is assigned as a partner and the partner is maybe identifying red flags that may be indicative of depression or something just being slightly off with an officer that may require a certain level of intervention. Is that officer then, you know, required uh, to report that to an immediate um, supervisor? What, what, how, where do you get no, your information? No. Is it does a person have to self-disclose most of the time, or is that information coming from colleagues, so, uh, you know, commanding um, officers, family members? Where is that information coming from? Which information? Information leading. I mean, if you have a, if you have an officer that's going, you know, uh, that's that's suffering from some sort of trauma, right? Uh, they're going through a divorce. They seem to be having a hard time at work. They, you know, exhibiting, you know, uh, symptoms of depression, severe depression. Um, where are you? How how do you identify that? Who's reporting that? You know. Well, How, what, what, the, what, what happens with an individual like that? Well, you're you assuming that people will know that that's the case, and, and that may not be the case, and often isn't mm -hmm. the case. But what, where, where, where if, if you work, if you and I are partners, and, and you, I'm, I'm the, way, the same way all the time, and then I come to work one day, and I'm 
doing something bizarre, you, you might ask me, you know, is this something I can do to help you, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is, are you okay? That, that kind of thing. So we, you know, we're encouraging people to seek help um, and we're encouraging through this peer counseling, uh, peer, peer process, peer support process, for example, to, to have officers who, as, as the chief referenced, that you're familiar with, that you know, but um, they could, if they offer help, that maybe perhaps you would be more inclined to, to. But I would, if I was an officer in need of help, I would have to solicit the, the services of the peer support network? No, 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 that, that's just the opposite in many ways. You, you wouldn't have to do anything. All I'm saying is that we, we're building this peer support mm -hmm. network so that officers will be able to identify that there's maybe something wrong and be able to listen um, and to be able to make a referral or suggest that you get help. That's, that's all that is. I mean, it, they're, they're not counselors. Uh, they could make a referral to uh, one of the clinicians. And, and so when we talk about the, well, the outreach, the wellness outreach process, where we have the psychologist, the clinician, and the EAU teams embedded in the, in the commands, it is our hope that, that what the question that you're asking, asking gets answered because those folks now um, have a relationship and build some trust within that environment uh, in the precincts and, and where these, this person, uh, anybody in distress, might say, hey, can I, can I speak to you? Do you, do you um, are you receptive to information coming from a family member of an individual? We that? often are. Yeah, family members often do call. So is, it, is there some sort of support supportive service to the family member? Like, is, are they directed to a team or is that a call to the commanding officer? What does that look well, like? Well, there'll be a conversation and they'll get contacted uh, when they call and, and that person who they speak with will make a determination who they should put them in touch with. Okay. Um, now, the, the, the EAU, you, is, it a, is it a unit? Yes. Where is it located? Uh, they're at 90 Church Street. There's only there's one per borough, or is it just one? No, it's, it's uh, well, that's where the unit, it, uh, that's where their main yeah, office is, yeah. uh, but they have people assigned uh, geographically to cover each borough, uh, and they have a uh, also a civilian peer, peer support person for uh, civilian members of the service. And if a, if a person contacts the EAU unit, is there an average wait time? No, they, they're available 24-7. Uh, and our medical division as well is available 24-7, 365. Do you, does the, the NYPD um, use, there's a telecom, there's like this, uh, this uh, some, some uh, for-profit organizations use this, but they'll have like a number that they'll give to employees and say, you know, if you're suffering from some sort of trauma or, the, you know, you're, you're just feeling stressed out, you're going through something and you need somebody to talk to, here's this number. Um, you can call, it's confidential, so that that way they kind of remove themselves a little bit from the department if they're feeling some sort of intrepidation doing that, but they're, but they're also you know, actively seeking the support in a way that they feel comfortable seeking that support. Well, one of the, we, we, do, we do have lots of numbers that you can call. We have a, a new app on, on all of our offices. Offices have a smartphone, so we now have an app on that smartphone which provides them with information. Um, and with no phone numbers and that they can get in touch with if they choose to, to use these resources. That's what we're trying to do. But are those resources connected to the NYPD or are they independent? Some are and some are outside. Okay. And, we, you know, we're working with uh, NYC well. Um, you know, so there are lots of, we're, what we're trying to do is, is, is provide them with a broad range of resources that, that, that are at their disposal um, and, and encourage them to, the message always is, encourage them to, if they, if they need help and, they, and they're stressed or whatever is, is happening with them, that they take advantage of those, that those, that they take advantage of those resources and to make it um, available to them in a way in which they, they feel comfortable. Um, calling that number, it may be outside the agency. I mean, that happens now. Uh, people go seek help um, um, in a variety of ways. Uh, and. Um, you know, that's, that's been the norm and we're trying to expand the opportunity and the resource uh, pool so that people have more options, I guess. Yeah. So and, then, and then try and point them in those directions. So my, my last question, if, 
if an officer is responding, and I guess the same question for the FDNY, if, 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 uh, if a first responder is responding to a traumatic, you know, um, event, uh, you know, a, a, a shooting, a, an incident involving a child, um, what happens after that? Is there, does the officer have to say, hey, you know, I mean, I just witnessed something and I don't know how to process that, or is there an automatic uh, response from that uh, police station that says, you know, listen, you know, this was like, you know, an awful traumatic experience. You know, we want you to come in and do, I think you refer to it as some sort of like uh, re reporting period or whatever, some sort of analysis that happens well, afterwards. Well, we, we are, we will be proactive. I mean, when we have officers who were shot in the line of duty or injured in the line of duty um, and, and, or die in the line of duty, um, then we will, our, our family assistance unit, our, emer our uh, employee assistance unit, all will be part of, of the network that, that kicks in to provide services to the individual officer, to the officers who were part of and partners with and on the scene and witnessed it, uh, the event, and, and, and in cases uh, where the, the officers, uh, there's a death that occurs, then the, the families are forever, really, uh, part of, of receiving any services that, we, uh, that they need from us. Uh, does that service so, extend it, though, to, does it go beyond uh, police-involved shootings? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's not just police-involved shootings, and it's not just where police die. I mean, shootings, people are injured, and officers are injured, and they live. Um, they may, you know, be um, uh, physically, um, you know, have a physical disability. I mean, we've had, you know, officers uh, um, who have been with us, Stephen McDonald, Officer McDonald, who was, who, was, who, was, who was shot back in the 80s and then lived for another 37 or so years. Uh, we were always a part of, of the support for, for, for not only Stephen, but his family, his son um, and his wife. And, and and his extended family as well. But if it, so, let's assume case scenario: there's a there's a fire, and you have, um, you know, multiple fatalities in the building. I mean, we've all seen the pictures where we have officers, police officers, fire um, officials coming out, you know, firefighters coming out with babies in their hands that didn't make it, and, um, you know, that that's a very traumatic experience for anybody. And police officers and firefighters routinely see and have these type of experiences. What does that, what happens after something like that? Is there an automatic response to, you know, with, with the individuals involved that addresses what they just went through that allows them to process it? Or is the expectation that if they can't and they feel personally that they can't, you know, a week later, they're still having, you know, uh, a problem with this, that they're gonna come to an immediate supervisor and say, hey, you know, I, I need help. What does that look like for the NYPD versus the FDNY? For FDNY, as soon as we're notified that there is an event, we immediately deploy our peer team who will go out to the site itself as it's happening, or to the hospitals, and then we'll follow up with the uh, EMS, uh, houses to the firehouses we act we we send them out immediately mm -hmm. to both provide counseling debriefing and let them know of CSU services and then we follow up we keep going because sometimes as the deployments change and uh, members are placed different places or they'll come off service we keep following up until we catch each member that was involved in the event to make sure that uh, that they're taken care of and then providing, uh, offering them services should they feel the need. And that then extends to the families as well. I appreciate that. All right, thank you. Thank you, we're gonna go to uh, Chair Borelli and then to Council Member Levine. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is the administration's panel. Is anyone here from Thrive New York? No, this is PD and FDNY. Is, uh, is there anyone here in the audience from Thrive New York that will be testifying today? Okay, so just to be clear, uh, just for the record, we spend $250 million a year on a mental health agency in New York City uh, who 
decided that no one was able to come and testify about mental health issues regarding our city's first responders. That said, uh, I, I would have started off by speaking about the uh, 122 police officers nationally who killed themselves this year, uh, but I saw news just broke this morning that a police officer in Chicago uh, also killed uh, himself. Um, the fourth, I think, in Chicago, and it's, it's a national issue uh, because the 122 to date is almost uh, the 140 that I was able to find happened in 2017, the last year on record, more than the number of police officers killed in the line of duty. So I want to ask the question about what is driving this, um, this phenomenon nationally, uh, Chief. You had said uh, in your comments that police officers sign up to be the ones providing help. Um, do, you, do you think that the rhetoric uh, we see nationally um, that frames police officers in, in uh, devious ways um, as monsters, do you think that affects the mentality of police officers showing up to work every day? So I, I would say I, I've got 33 years of experience and for my entire time on the job, it has been a difficult job at times. Uh, police officers deal with a great deal of stress. We see horrific crime scenes. Uh, we, we deal with people at their worst going through very difficult times. Uh, and, and certainly we're not oblivious to the political climate that may be going on uh, nationally. So all of that has always existed. Uh, I can remember throughout my career uh, things like that occurring. Um, so I, I think it's you know, maybe a mistake to try to pinpoint one particular issue. Uh, the science and the study around suicide has evolved quite a bit over the last decade or so, and we're learning a lot more than we knew even 10 years ago. Uh, but I, I also think that uh, well, what I know is that what we've learned, there is no single cause of suicide. Uh, Suicide rates have been increasing nationally since 1999. Uh, nationally, we're up uh, about 40% since that time period. It's uh, the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. overall. Second leading cause of death for people in their 20s. Uh, so it's a national phenomenon. And you know, the commissioner earlier was talking about you know, who commits suicide in the NYPD, and we look at the demographics. It really cuts across all demographics internally people relatively new on the job, people with a lot of time on the job, and everything in between. We do tend to follow the national trends in terms of, you know, male whites are, are the single largest group who take their own lives by suicide, uh, certainly more men than women. Uh, we see that nationally, we see it locally within the NYPD, albeit the overall suicide rate in the NYPD is, is higher than the national average. Over the last several years, the national average was tracking at about 12 per 100,000. We were at 14. And then this year, we've seen a huge uh, increase. Uh, but again, I get back to that, that point. What we learned from the science is that there is no single cause of suicide. Uh, what we see is that it's a combination of biological, psychological, and then social and environmental factors all of those on top of an individual's current life events. Uh, add to that the availability of lethal means. And when you, you bring all those things together, uh, once a person starts down that path and they kind of reach that point where it's just one stressor too many, they then develop what's known as cognitive inflexibility, where they get this tunnel vision, they feel isolated and hopeless and helpless, and they feel that there's no way out and the only solution is suicide. Uh, and then with the availability of lethal means, that then puts them uh, basically in that position where they take their own life. So I, I think it's, it's a very, very complicated issue. We really don't understand. We're all looking for, we're all struggling for that why. We just don't know. But we do know that it's complicated and there are many, many factors, many risk factors sure. that will affect Sure, I, I, I wasn't suggesting that that, that would be the, the pinpoint motive in uh, all the cases, certainly not even a majority, perhaps. Um, I, guess, uh, I guess I'll ask the same question in a different way. If we asked uh, the cop on the beat at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal right now uh, whether or not the rhetoric we see nationally, the rhetoric we see locally, 
the policies and justifications for those policies we see uh, here in City Hall and elsewhere. Um, if I asked those cops, would they say that those factors are demoralizing and uh, add to the stress level of a police officer's already difficult job? They may, yeah. uh, I, but I, I think that, you know, the point that when we're talking about mental health and wellness and suicide, uh, cops are, like most people, remarkably resilient. And, and we all absorb a lot of stress uh, and we all deal with a lot of risks every day. Uh, everything from family life to work life to uh, other environmental and social factors that we all deal with and we're all able to absorb that uh, and deal with it. When we talk about suicide, yeah, certainly there can be many, many combinations of factors that pile up. Uh, w was this a topic that was discussed in the, 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 co the day of conference that you had referenced, uh, Commissioner? We, t we touched on many, I mean, it was an all-day conference and, and this, this topic, I'm sure, came up. I wasn't there for the entire conference. I was there for the morning session, primarily. But I think, you know, to the Chief's point, it is, it is just that elusive in terms of understanding that dynamic, right? You just don't know. Um, but, but, but again, I mean, cops are resilient. I mean, the, the job is stressful. That is by far, it is, it is. Firemen run into burning buildings. I, I would never become a fireman. I became a cop. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm willing to run into, you know, with the guys with the guns, but I'm not running into a fire. You know, so God bless the firemen. But, but I think cops are, they're willing to, they take the job, they want to serve, they want to do good, and I think that's, you know, uh, but, and, they, and they accept pretty much the, the stresses that come along with it. Um, most of them, majority, the great majority, I think, cope. But I think to your earlier point, you know, I, th I do think that what happens outside of the job and what impacts the job, the rhetoric, uh, I referenced it in my, in my testimony, uh, the antagonism, uh, the disrespect, those things are certainly stressors. I'm not suggesting that those stresses will take you to the point where you become suicidal, um, but they are stressors. And, and no, I, and thank I, you. I guess my, my point was more to just indicate that um, every job has stress. If I was going to a high-stress job where I may risk my life, uh, and I'm not saying every cop needs a pat on the back every minute of the day or a medal, I'm simply saying that I think it probably is tremendously demoralizing. And I'm not, I'm not speaking, I'm not making this up. This is, this is from the cops that I know, the, the, the guys and, and women that, that I share a beer with probably too often. But <coughs> this is the topic of conversation quite often, that it's tough to want to do the job every day and risk life and limb when your fear, you have a fear of of the, the resentment that is sort of caused by your very presence. Uh, but no, nonetheless, I'll just move on a little bit. Um, can you talk about the uh, overall budget allocated to the PD, um, to mental health services, and also Dr. Schmerler, I, uh, same thing with the fire department, what is the overall budget allocated for these services? I'll talk for, for the FDNY for right now. There are uh, 4.2 million are allocated annually to the CSU for mental health services for the department. Okay. Do we have any, any idea for the police? It, I think it'd be challenging for us to, to sit here and, and sure. sort of give you numbers um, because the services are uh, spread throughout the, the agency, through EAU, through our medical division. Um, so, so I'm, I'm not sure. We could probably come up with a number at some point and mm -hmm. share it with you that we think gets close to that. Uh, the the follow-up question was an easier one. I think it's just, uh, uh, Council Member, just, just to add, I, we're not shortchanging. I, I think the takeaway is that we're not shortchanging any programs. I want to so, see if you guys need more money for this. No, no, I understand. So the, the idea is that we're, we're always striving to provide more services or more opportunities for our officers, and we do that with, in partnership with Thrive and, and other agencies and outside entities. And, you know, we, it's just dispersed throughout. It's not one single unit that we allocate a dollar amount to, and, and everything falls under that one unit, so we can just carve out and spit out a number at you. 
but that's ju that's our Perfect. model. Thank you. I, I think there's a consensus on this side of the table that should you identify needs and and additional resources for this purpose, there would be uh, uh, an effort to to give those. Um, la last thing I want to ask about is. Um, when, when the PD refers people to outside clinicians, is that covered by the insurance uh, policies of each respective contract, or just how, how does that work? How, how does that work with respect to insurance reimbursements? And generally, yes. So, uh, so generally, yes. Um, our medical division, for example, the psychologists we have, they will conduct assessments, but they don't necessarily provide treatment. Uh, the treatment is left to the individual member of the service to pursue with their either their primary care physician or mental health care provider that they select through their insurance. Currently, uh, there are seven different insurance programs available to members of the NYPD. Uh, over 90% of NYPD uh, members uh, have Emblem Health. Uh, so, you know, most of the health care is through Emblem Health. For medical and primary care physicians, it's through an Emblem provider. Uh, for mental health care, uh, Emblem uh, has uh, contracts that work out to Beacon Health, um, but through Emblem Health, uh, a member of the service who has that insurance can get coverage. The coverages vary depending upon which plan you have and whether or not you have a rider uh, and whether you're in network or out of network, and it can, the landscape can get very, very complicated. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's one of the most common calls our employee assistance unit gets is from people having difficulty understanding and navigating the healthcare system, and we will provide that help. We'll make the calls for them, we'll sit with them, we'll help them make an appointment and, and get a provider. Uh, we also have a network of department, NYPD department surgeons, and a network of honorary surgeons who we have relationships with. Um, and through that network, through our supervising chief surgeon and the department surgeons and our network of honorary surgeons, sometimes we can facilitate uh, getting appointments or uh, uh, getting the appropriate uh, health care. Are there any opportunities when a member of the NYPD would be denied uh, mental health coverage because of a plan they chose or have a very high co-payment? Uh, theoretically, sure, uh, depending upon their plan and what the treatment requires and whether or not uh, medications are covered and to what extent and, and how many uh, visits are covered and whether it's inpatient or outpatient. There are a lot of permutations to it, uh, so it, it could. I'm not aware of any personally, but theoretically it could. It just seems that that, that should be something, I mean, considering we give police officers the, the power to hold people against their will, you know, the full power of the state to end a life, perhaps. I mean, it just seems that there should be no financial impediments to, to a person seeking this type of mental health counseling. Uh, what about the leave policy uh, for both the FDNY, actually, and the uh, NYPD? Can, does an employee have to take personal time to see a mental health uh, clinician? Uh, it depends on, depends on their role. Um, usually a firefighter or EMT will come in on their off time. If, um, if that, they're not capable of doing that, they'll get leave time if they come in. Okay. And those, um, they'll come in-house to our clinicians in-house. Clinicians that we have in-house are culturally competent. They know the job that they do. Uh, they're aware of it. Um, they're usually referred by one of our peer counselors who has a relationship with that, so that way it kind of builds the trust. Okay, thank you. Is there? It's similar for NYPD, and you know, it depends upon the unique circumstances. Members uh, can seek uh, health care on their own time and, and generally do. However, if a member is out sick uh, or is, uh, for example, some of our counseling services programs that we provide are on job time. Uh, so you could use sick time, in which case you're paid and you're off, you see your uh, physician, uh, or uh, some of our counseling programs are done on job time. Is there any opportunity uh, through Thrive uh, NYC for a police officer or a firefighter to receive free and relatively immediate mental health services? Well, they can get... Um the, the, if they take advantage of the of the 24-hour hotline, and they can then get services through through that uh, that process, right? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Going to go to Councilmember Levine, followed by Levine. I also want to acknowledge we were joined by Councilmember Miller, and we're also joined by Alika, Councilmember Alika Samuels as well. 
Um, so Levine and then Gibson. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We need to attack this crisis on multiple fronts, which is why we are pushing for more clinical resources in the department and we want to remove barriers to members of the department accessing resources outside of the department. And there are reasons that someone could pursue either channel. Someone in the department has the advantage of maybe being embedded in a command, getting to know members of the department, so it becomes a really normal uh, type of service. Um, uh, we are looking to remove the stigma, and we think that could be a very effective tool for that. But we understand the sensitivity around confidentiality, and that some members of the department might prefer to go to an outside provider like PAPA. In either case, it's so critical that the officers understand that their career will not be negatively impacted simply by asking for help. Um, and you've spoken about this some today already, but I, I do want to give you a chance to confirm. If someone simply requests a meeting because they are suffering with a social worker or psychologist in the department, or if someone seeks outside help from PAPA or another provider, does that in any way trigger a report to a superior, or is there any information transferred that could affect that officer? No, so PAPA is confidential. If a member contacts PAPA and they get services through PAPA, uh, that, that is confidential. I, th th there could be some circumstances where there's an immediate threat to somebody's safety, have to be hospitalized, uh, that, that may get more resources involved, but uh, generally know that that is confidential. Similarly, if somebody goes to their own physician uh, and, uh, or, or social worker or, or other clinician and seek some treatment, uh, that too is confidential, it's protected by HIPAA, and it's between that individual person and their practitioner. One of the intents of our bill in establishing the idea of an annual mental health checkup, which would be voluntary, I want to emphasize, is that it begins to feel routine, and that there's no kind of red flags that emerge because someone gets the checkup. As I mentioned earlier, just like you'd get a physical, doesn't mean you're necessarily sick, it's just you're taking preventative action. Um, can you explain the exact protocols that would require a clinician then to report that a person is in danger to themselves that might then trigger uh, the need to um, temporarily take uh, the service weapon and possibly the badge? Sure, it could be something as overt as an attempt to take one's own life. Uh, it, it could be suicidal ideation where the person is expressing a desire uh, to take their own life. Uh, or it could be even be a medication or combination of medications that debilitate somebody to the point where, you know, if, if, uh, uh, if, if a side effect of the medication is that you cannot operate machinery, you probably can't drive a car or exercise the judgment that we need a police officer to have when they're on duty. So again, it, we will defer to our trained professionals, our medical staff, to make those determinations on a case-by-case -case basis. Ideally, we want to speak to the member involved, we want to speak to, to their physician, uh, we may want to talk to family and friends and coworkers, depending upon the facts and circumstances. Sometimes, if the source of the stress is coming from home, then we probably would not want to bring in the family member because that could further uh, aggravate the situation. And what about if it's the family member themselves who makes a report that they're concerned about the safety of their loved one? Uh, how is that information transferred? What are the protocols there? So it'll, it'll be handled similarly. So I, I can just say general numbers in 2018, when we look at people who reached out to the employee assistance units, and we, we don't uh, track identities, uh, but we do keep some empirical data for analysis purpose because we want to know why people are calling and what services they need. We had almost 2,000 phone calls last year. Uh, over 1,100 were from the person themselves doing a self-referral. And, and that ran the spectrum, everything from I'm in a very, very bad place and I need 
critical care right now to I'm having trouble navigating my insurance, can you help me figure out uh, what insurance coverage I have and who to call? And, and we deal with all that. We also deal with a lot of those risk factors and stressors that could be contributing factors to suicide, like financial issues, like marital difficulty, like uh, bereavement and grief, and a whole host of, of issues that people may be dealing with. So of the balance of the 2000, uh, we get uh, a few hundred uh, calls from uh, other members of the service who are calling about somebody else, uh, and we get some number that come from family members uh, calling about a family member who they're concerned about. And, and we will begin, irrespective of where that call originates from, we will begin that process to reach out to that person, get a hold of them, interview them, find out what their issues are, uh, if necessary, get them with a clinician, uh, and or get them through their insurance coverage to, to uh, private care if that's the appropriate response. Some of the recent cases of death by suicide have been among retirees. And that leads me to wonder about your strategy for reaching people who are no longer coming to work every day. Can you have a presence at a pension office or some other venue where you know you'll have contact with retirees? Sure, so uh, one of the things that we're looking at, um, you know, if and when we establish this outreach program where we have trained clinicians to include psychologists, social workers, and employee assistants, peer counselors, ideally we would want to have a team at the police pension fund. So when people go to retire, we can do kind of an end of career debriefing. Currently, when people go down and file for retirement, part of the package they get when they leave is an informational brochure from our employee assistance program that talks about retirement, talks about some of the stress of retirement, uh, provides information about various peer support programs that uh, they can participate in for retirees, uh, and also invites them to contact the employee assistance unit uh, if they ever need trouble. And we do get calls every year, albeit from small numbers, uh, from retirees who reach back uh, to get assistance from us, and we will provide that assistance. But if you had adequate staffing, then this could be not just a brochure you hand someone upon retirement, but an actual in-person consultation, potentially. Certainly. If, if we had clinicians on site, we could do some type of interview or debriefing for people who are filing for retirement. We're currently working with the Police Pension Fund now to uh, develop an outreach program to um, send out information to retirees. Uh, ret all retirees get a quarterly pension statement, uh, and uh, they also do periodic uh, mailings on uh, information about upcoming, upcoming events. So we're looking to include information uh, uh, about uh, insurance coverage, uh, as well as about employee assistance services. Auxiliary officers and other part-time personnel could face many of the same stresses. Uh, sure, that, and, that and we make the information available to them. So. Uh, a lot of our outreach is really focused at the command level. So we have information centers that we've put up. We've designed a whole series of informational brochures. We've created a series of videos that deal with suicide, stress, postpartum depression, grief. Uh, uh, things as sublime as little tags for uh, every uh, keychain for a department vehicle has the employee assistance phone number on it. So just a constant reminder, always available, uh, and, and we've had some success stories. You know, recently we had a member of the service who took one of these brochures, folded it up, put it in his pocket. Uh, three days later at 2 a.m. called and said, I'm in a real bad way. And, and we got that person in some inpatient care and, uh, you know, hopefully made a difference. A final question. Papa's come up a lot today. They're such an outstanding resource, in part because it's peer-led and uh, officers of value the opportunity to speak to someone who's been there. Um, what are the other nonprofits, or or could you at least give us a sense of the number of other nonprofits and outside providers beyond Papa that you are working with? So we we worked with a number of organizations locally. Um, uh, so for example, uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, their chief medical officer has been working with us uh, for our executive level training as well as uh, some in-service training we're currently designing. Uh, the American Association of Suicidology, they provide our training for the psychological autopsies uh, through NYC Well, uh, and one of their organizations that they work with, Vibrant, uh, we're getting clinicians for the command level training that we're, we're currently doing. Uh, 
so we, we, we have that going on. And then through uh, NYC Thrive and um, uh, DOHMH doing the mental health first aid training. Uh, that's been ongoing. Like the commissioner said, we've trained 8,000 primarily uh, pol uh, police communication technicians, traffic enforcement agents, and school safety agents. But now we're in the process of training uniform members of the service, so, so that's ongoing. Um, we, uh, uh, you know, recently, so because of this, as another, uh, let me just back up a minute. So our priority from the very beginning is to encourage members to get help. And like the commissioner said, when we did the executive training, the primary message, you know, we gave them information about the science around suicide, uh, information about suicide in the NYPD, uh, information about warning signs and intervention techniques and, and preventive measures and resources that are available. But we said your primary mission here is, is one of leadership, to set the tone, create the culture, uh, uh, and we want people to know that the department's number one priority is that you get help. If you need help, if you know somebody who needs help, get help. Whether it's through the medical division, through employee assistance, uh, through PAPA, through your own private doctor, uh, going to a New York City hospital. It, it doesn't matter. Wherever you are most comfortable, go and, and get help. That's the number one priority. So along those lines, and looking to expand the availability uh, of services that are available outside the NYPD, because we recognize there is a stigma and there, there is a certain level of difficulty coming forward internally. So if people are more comfortable going outside, we began, as the commissioner said, you know, we looked at Project COPE from 2001-2002 uh, uh, and designed a program similar to that that would provide uh, mental health health care to members of the service free of charge who needed it uh, in a confidential way uh, and, and from a known and respected health care provider uh, that, that could deliver the services that our members need. So along those lines, we uh, went down the path of conducting an emergency procurement. So the procurement rules under the, the city can be quite cumbersome, but we have the ability to do an emergency acquisition, and we did that. We were able to secure the funding. Uh, we solicited some health care providers who could provide the mental health care services that we needed, and uh, we have reviewed the responses. There was only one who was capable of performing uh, these services 24-7, 365, having uh, health care professionals available to treat our members, and that is New York Presbyterian. So we have uh, sent them a letter of intent uh, that we're accepting their proposal, uh, and we think we can begin that as early as next week. Uh, so uh, we're working out the details now, but we will be promoting that internally, uh, letting members know that uh, another option they will have that will be confidential will be to go to New York Presbyterian, and they'll have a dedicated hotline and they'll have dedicated staff to deal with our members. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councilmember Gibson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Richards, Chair Ayala, and Chair Borelli, and Councilmember Levine for leading the effort on introducing um, 1704. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. And certainly, I echo the sentiments expressed by my colleagues and chairs. And first and foremost, our continued prayers to the department, both the NYPD and the FDNY. And certainly, uh, any life that we lose by death at suicide is always a call to action. And really, as a department as an administration, looking at some of our internal mechanisms and how we can provide better services, and really meeting officers where they are. And I appreciate uh, our deputy chief really being honest um, and understanding that officers balancing both professional and personal lives is a real challenge. And when you look at policing in 2019, it's changed significantly from when many of you started in the department. Um, and so if you look at the recent deaths we've had, uh, they have been different ranks, different ages, uh, retired. Um, and so obviously, while there is no pattern or trend, but certainly the uniform member of service is the common theme. Um, so I appreciate a lot of the work 
work and effort that has been already expended. Uh, I do know EAU very well and PAPA, uh, as well as the chaplain's unit, which we continue to expand on. Um, but I wanted to ask specifically, you alluded to Thrive NYC, mental health first aid training, and a number of other efforts that the department is embarking on. I also think that in order for officers to feel completely comfortable, confidentiality and real confidentiality has to be a priority. And we know the culture that sometimes we create ourselves, whether we're here in the council, any other agency, it's a culture uh, that exists. Um, we know about it. And so we know that although we always make every effort to be confidential, the reality is it's not always confidential. And the talk amongst ranks and, and different officers is really there. And so breaking down that system and looking at this from a holistic perspective is really our, our overarching goal. Um, so in addition to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Thrive NYC, um, I wanted to ask, are you engaging our external partners in our fraternal organizations, which we have a lot of, because many of them have a real intimate relationship with their members. They meet ongoing. And so working with our external partners like a Noble or the Guardians or any of the other organizations to really reach their members at that level, has that been started? And if not, is that something you think would be productive? Well, certainly, I, and we, we do have an active involvement with our fraternal organizations. They are kind of key to so much of the culture in the agency. So yes, we do, and they are included in this whole effort to go forward. Uh, and it, they've been involved in the past when we, when we came out with uh, Are You OK campaign. They were very much in the mix on that as well. So I remember that. So yes. Um, and you know it's interesting because that that issue uh, speaking with someone from noble the other day and that issue came up with respect to the peer process and who the folks are so there is some sensitivity around that and making sure mm -hmm. that that the, whoever the volunteers are have a broad uh sense of that that it, that it covers the multitude of, of of people in the department what the department looks like that was a, that was a particular concern but um beyond that i think you know everything that we're doing really cuts across uh, every aspect of, of the membership. Uh, and, and, and that obviously includes all of the fraternals. Okay, and I know my time is up, but I just wanted to, if I could, just very two quick questions. Uh, Chair Ayala and I believe Council Member Levine already talked about it, but I know that one of the challenging points in an officer's career is as they age out um, of the department at age 63, um, once they put in their papers, there's a series of things that will happen, but we know that they're going to age out at some point. So before they get to the police pension fund, what is the work that we're doing to work with them as they transition out? And then the second question is, there's nothing greater than the support of a family. And while understanding that has to be very particular in how you attack it, um, but the family support, spouses and children and other relatives in an officer's lives can also prove very beneficial, um, obviously very case-by-case -case basis, if you understand what I mean. Um, but what type of family support services are we also offering while respecting that individual officer's privacy, and then obviously as they transition out um, into retirement? Well, with respect to the outreach, um, you know, seminars are conducted by EAU as well for, for people who are about to age out and, uh, or who are going to put in their papers and retire, uh, not because of age, but just because of the, whatever the tenure is, 20 years mm -hmm. or, or so. Uh, right. And so that is, that'll be and is part of the normal process right now. As I said in the, earlier in my testimony, the things that have been in place now we want to make sure that, that, that we build on those foundations. This would be one of those aspects. So as it relates to uh, people, as they get closer to, notwithstanding the seminars, we are actually exploring what else we, you know, we talked about how early we want to intervene uh, and, and speak with someone. Is it a year out before they, you know, if, if it's aging out, a year before, year and a half before? What, what does that look like? We haven't come up with a particular um, a model yet, I don't think but it is part of the conversation that's taking place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairs. Thank you. Uh, just, we're gonna go to the last round of questions. Can you talk about Project COPE a little bit more? So in your testimony, you spoke of 
um, the initiative being started in the wake of 9-11. Um, so, and back then, obviously, you partnered with private hospitals to provide counseling sessions with private clinicians in a 24-hour hotline without charge to officers coping with trauma from attacks. And I think in your testimony, you also allude to an RFP being issued. Can you just yes. speak a little bit more about that? Well, as, as the chief referenced just a moment ago, we, are, we, are, we sent them a letter of intent with respect to the services you just outlined. Uh, they are um, the only one that sort of fit the model that we, when we did the, the, the uh, initial uh, brief procurement uh, RFP. And so we hope to, I mean, we have, a, we have the emergency procurement um, in place and we're acting on it. And, um, and we, we hope to have an agreement and begin services uh, within a few weeks. And this will be permanent? Yeah, well, it will be permanent. So in as much as it's, it's uh, 18, is it 18? 18 months. 18 month procurement. So then we have to do a, a larger RFP and then, you know, we'll have other folks who may come so in. We this, won't have to worry about this ending because after 9/11 it ended. So I just wanted to. Well, yeah, I think, I think right. there are lots of reasons why okay. it ended um, okay. because of what the initial purpose was. But um, and, and the other thing that I think you know, I, I think it's you know the notion that we're doing it for 18 months because of the procurement restrictions is is actually not a bad thing because we this will give us a sense of right. how many people access it, how many people use the mm -hmm. services. That'll tell us something in and of itself in terms of of. of efficacy of that particular model. Maybe we need to do something. And just speak about your plan on a clinician. So your plan would be, if, if this bill were to pass, to ensure that uh, every precinct has clinicians. Have you come up with a plan on what that looks like? Yeah, we, yeah. we, we do. I don't, I don't know if we have the particulars, but um, the goal is to create 58, 58 teams, teams of, of um, uh, that would, and, and it's based on just the geography, the, the number of boroughs we have, the eight boroughs and so forth. And so, and then also, so to cover the transit districts, PSAs, uh, um, and precincts, but also um, so all the uh, all of those folks. But then we have, um, I think, ultimately nine groups um, uh, that would one of which would be uh, in, in terms of the boroughs. Uh, we'd also have a, a group uh, that would deal with the administrative offices, like um, particularly headquarters, as an example, uh, specialized units. So, but that's the, that's the goal, and then we'd have the clinicians and the, you know the the psychologists, the, the clinicians, and and uh, those folks who would be accessible and embedded in those in those areas, um, and and to build that, to build trust. So, uh, as as apropos of the conversation we had earlier, uh, where people will become familiar with this team of people um, in their in their area. So it's uh, I think we're we're talking about enough. Uh, uh, teams that would, would provide services to, on average, a thousand um, uh, offices. That's, that's how we sort of roughed it out, so you have a sense of how it would work. And then my last and question obviously is- Obviously, not every, you know, not every person uh, in those, in, in these, in, in, in throughout the department would be taken advantage of, that's the assumption, would be taken advantage of it. So 58 teams, um, 25, to start off with um, in the early in the early stages, so this 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 protocol that, that this uh, the early part of it was 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 standing up, would we start with the 25? We'll build to the 58, but we'll also learn as we go. All right, and then the last question I have is, uh, I want to note one provision of the bill requires the department to make wellness information sessions available to officers annual annually. Does the department agree that encouraging officers to sit down with someone? who can help make sure that they're doing okay and that they know how to get more help if they need it is, is a valuable way to keep officers emotionally uh, healthy? Uh, listen, I think so. I think it's in, it's in, it's in line with what we're proposing in, in anyway, right? right. Um, we want to make sure that any officer, any civilian who needs help has, has the ability to get that help. And so, Oleg, you support the bill? And, and, know, it's, and know it's available. We look forward to working with you. Yes. <laughs> okay. I have to pick one. No leg. He didn't speak today. All right. All righty. I'm going to go back to Borelli, and then uh, we'll start to wrap up this panel. Thanks. Just a, a final questions for the fire department. Um, how many members of service utilize the uh, counseling service unit? Well, approximately twenty-five to three thousand a year actually come in for a session, uh, with at least one session to see one of our licensed counselors. 
uh, tens of thousands in the field with our peer counselors, tens of thousands of contacts each year. 2,500. 2,500 to 3,000 actually come in each year uh, to see. Does the department track whether the visit was uh, caused by jo job-related trauma or personal reasons or? Uh, we, we track it, the department doesn't. I mean, our records stay with us. So we, we have records of or people coming in for trauma or family issues, substance abuse, whatever that is, but that stays in-house with us. Um, in, in general terms, uh, what is the percentage that come for job-related uh, traumatic stress versus uh, something the general population might? might. Yeah, I, I think the, the number one reason people come in is actually for marital reasons. Uh, but then when you kind of dive down into marital re reasons, it may be job stress, it may be substance abuse or other, uh, you know, PTSD. Uh, so, but the number one thing we see, uh, the reason they say they're coming in is for marital reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and how, how does the department uh, basically inform members of the services available to them through the counseling unit? Well, th that's done every day with the teams that go out, uh, the peer teams that go out uh, to the stations uh, and, and the firehouses. Uh, we, we do that online as well through Diamond Plate. Uh, any chance we get, uh, any opportunity we get to, uh, to, to disseminate the services available, uh, we let them know. Um, and over a year, it takes time. Uh, that trust has been built over time, so it's really a sign of strength when someone says they need help. Um, firefighters talk about it at the kitchen table. One of the things that we do uh, with our EMS stations and firehouses, we educate them every day on different uh, mental issues like depression or PTSD. We go to the stations and small groups talk about it. And we ho our hope is when we leave, they're still having those conversations. Um, and that, uh, again, is, it helps lift stigma. And then, uh, since you're tracking the number of people, have, have there been more people seeking the services uh, in years, compared to years past? Or? Yeah, you know, it peaked at about 18 months after 9-11. Right. Um, I don't have the exact number in my head, but that's what was the highest. And then it kind of leveled out to 25 to 3,000, and it's been there for about, you know, 10 years. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty consistent. Uh, that we have our hotline gets about that the hotline is when the offices close after business hours and on weekends and that gets about 2,000 calls a year and 20% of those calls come from family members so um, others you know uh, the others are um, of members of service and, and our uh, cadets notified at the Academy or EMS Academy any type of training program at that point of services available oh yeah so um, education is done at Proby School and EMS, EMS Academies as every rank, um, as people move from rank to rank, uh, education piece is there. At annual medicals, once a year, uh, we do education. At retirement, we have education pieces. Uh, we really concerned about our retirees. It's, you know, the outreach is more difficult there. Uh, so we see them at our annual medicals through a WTC. There's always a peer support personnel seeing them each and every year. Uh, the other thing that we have in about five locations monthly is retiree breakfast, where we it's a social gathering, but we have um, services that are available and someone from peer support and one of our counselors there just to let them know that uh, they're not forgotten about. They've spent 25 to 30 years uh, serving this city. We, we, we will not forget them at CSU. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Tucker, do uh, officers, do members of service do an annual medical as well? No, they don't. Okay. All right, thank you all for coming out. Thank you for your work. We look forward to uh, continuing our partnership with you on this. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. The next panel, this is it. Nancy Carbone, Friends of Firefighters, John Petrullo, Papa, Beatrice Coronel, Commune Life Coalition for Be Behavioral Health, and Anita Iyer, Vibrant Emotional Health. Let me just call this again. Nancy Carbone, Friends of Firefighters. John Petrullo, Papa, Anita Iyer, Beatrice Car uh, Coronel, 
Commune Life Coalition for Baby Behavior Health. This mic seems to be working. Okay. John Petrullo. All right, thank you, you may begin. Hello, yeah. I'd like to thank this council for the opportunity to speak on this very sensitive issue, and I offer my condolences to the police officers, the police department, and the city as a whole, because if we lose a police officer or a first responder, we've all lost. Um, Friends of Firefighters has been in existence since immediately following 9-11, initially as a response to 9-11, but now serves firefighters active and retired and their families. Some of today's firefighters were in grade school back in 2001, but now they're on the job that requires tremendous dedication and sacrifice. Our success with the firefighting community is largely based on our policy of absolute confidentiality and it has grown largely through word of mouth. We started in one firehouse in 2001, quickly grew to five firehouses by January of 2002, and now that was actually in my car and in the firehouse kitchens, and we've grown uh, to all five boroughs. And I think the driving force of the firefighters themselves who asked me to start a nonprofit, to start a, uh, a uh, counseling uh, place outside of the, the fire department, uh, there was a perception in 2001, less so now, but there was a perception, strong perception, that uh, CSU was not the place they wanted to go. They didn't feel it was confidential. Um, over the many, many years in the interim, uh, we have actually now a, a good working relationship with CSU in that they now trust us. And, and for the good reason, right reasons, they didn't know who we were initially. They were a little cautious, uh, but the current fire commissioner, Dan Nigro, was our board chair for three years prior to taking the position. So there's an understanding now of why we exist. Um, I think it's important to say that the, the, the city councils that have supported us, we consider partners, and uh, we hope to partner with more to ensure our continuation. Um, but to say this is a delicate subject, it's an understatement. Um, I think it's past time that we do open the door, stop whispering the word suicide. There is a stigma, of course, to getting help. There is no blame, but there are gaps. And the gaps uh, that we'd like to close as friends of firefighters comes from understanding that there has to be a place for people to go that is separate from their job or their agency, such as the police department or the fire department. So to that end, our main place is uh, a firehouse, a circa 1870s firehouse in Brooklyn that the firefighters have built themselves. They've restored it to a firehouse. So when they come in, they feel very much at home. When we've had events that invite the police officers, they say, and it is without exception, we need a place like this. Um, I think a part of it is that they know that they have each other to speak to, so there's an understanding of what the job is about and the stressors, but also there are counselors there that are uh, credentialed and licensed and able to help them build a toolbox of different things they can do to help them through very, very difficult times. Uh, there's no argument as, uh, as to what they're up against in regards to the, the tragedies that they witness and are very much a part of and the toll that it takes. We also uh, consider the family um, a very, very integral part to helping the firefighter. The first responder goes home at the end of a tour and uh, there's oftentimes a disconnect. So if we aren't helping the firefighter, we are not helping the family. I think it's also important to say uh, on a personal note, my grandfather chose suicide as an out and so the ripple effect on the families lasts for generations. So it's incredibly important to me that all gaps are closed. I offer Friends of Firefighters with my board support, my staff support to help the NYPD so that it can be a center for them to drop in to know that they have help there for them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Petrullo, the director. Now press your button. I'm John Petrullo, the director of PAPA. 
I just wanted to make myself available in case there's any questions uh, about Papa and what we do. And uh, if you'd like, I can give you a little history of Papa, how it all started. Uh, Papa wound up in, in this facility uh, back in 1995 when we had 26 suicides. And one of the solutions was to have a peer group that would help the cops that would be independent of the police department. When it initially was set up, it was a suicide hotline for the cops to call. It's changed so much since then, it's no longer just a suicide hotline. We get less suicide calls now, but we do get a number of calls that back in the day we would never get because the cops wouldn't pick up the phone to call. So now we have cops that call long before it gets to crisis. We're able to avail them mental health professionals uh, by meeting with another peer. Uh, the peer difference between our peer and department peer is that they're doing it on their time. It's confidential, uh, and that helps us break that wall down, the stigma a little bit. When they call for help, they know that it's not going to go anywhere, and that's been a huge part of the success. Through the years, we've had uh, about 150 officers that were talking about completing a suicide, which came through the program, and the majority of them were able to get better and get back to full duty. We have a lot of different programs that we now do. We do a two-day assist. We do that at least four times a year where we teach our officers and we allow them to bring in their families or friends uh, what to look for in somebody who may be suicidal. We've also increased it now where we're doing an outreach on self-care for them. Uh, <clears throat> earlier in the year, we did outreaches for uh, up at the range. We were able to reach uh, roughly 20,000 of our officers uh, giving them a presentation on suicide awareness, self-care. <clears throat> We've now started to incorporate meditation into it. We're going to be offering classes on meditation to police officers and their family just as another uh, way for them to, to reach out to see if they can get some stress relief. Uh, we know that that's not the answer. That's not the only thing. But from the police officers we've heard from that due to meditation, they say they get a huge relief from it. Uh, we've also started a family program, uh, and we targeted Staten Island. Thank you to, to Cong uh, Councilman Borelli uh, for supporting us with that, where we brought the police officers together with their families so that they can come together, have a better understanding of the stresses of police work, uh, what the family members could look out for in their loved one, uh, and also gave them a piece on how to nurture relationships. If we can keep them in better relationships, it may alleviate some of the stress uh, where they may not bring the stress home with them. Uh, we've had, we roughly get about 400 to 500 calls into our active line uh, using utilizi utilizing 200 of our peer support officers. We have another 80 that are on the retiree team, so we also keep in mind our retirees. That's nationwide. We have retirees from Florida, from East Coast to West Coast, and we have peers involved that can go out and meet with them when they are out of state. Uh, so with that, that's just a summary of what we do. And if you have any questions, you'd be more than welcome to answer them. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Come back Thank to you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Push the button. Pass the magic button. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> good afternoon. I'd like to thank the City Council for inviting Communion Life to speak here today. Uh, my name is Julie Lawrence. I'm stepping in for Beatrice, who had to go and run our after-school program in Brooklyn. But thank you very much for having us here. Um, Communal Life's Life is Precious program, also known as LIP, opened 11 years ago and has centers in Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens, and is New York City's only suicide prevention program for at-risk Latina teens. Um, the CDC Youth Risk Behavior Study stated that in 2017, 20.9% of Latina teens in New York City seriously considered suicide, and that 13.1% attempted suicide. Statistics that are higher than their peers. Today I'm here to speak to you about how our experiencing developing LIP can be a template for developing culturally and linguistically appropriate suicide prevention strategy, strategies for the police department and first responders. The recent spat of first responders who have committed suicide is a tragedy for which a strategy must be developed to abate it. We know that for every person who completes suicide, there are many more who seriously consider suicide. We also know that first responders in the police department have their own culture and language. 
that language goes beyond English or Spanish, but includes how words and phrases are perceived. When we developed Life is Precious, we knew that there was an epidemic affecting our community and that we wanted to do something about it, but we did not know what the best way was. For this, we went directly to the Latinx community. We spoke with the teens, parents, educators, and community leaders. We learned why they thought that this was happening, what services they thought should be provided, and most importantly, how to destigmatize and talk about the issue. We learned how the topic should be approached. Fast forward 11 years, LIP remains a community-informed program. New activities are developed based on the input from our teens and their families. New centers are opened in neighborhoods where our teens reside or go to school, and our social media web presence and awareness campaigns are developed in the, with their help. Since our Life is Precious program opened in 2008, more than 350 Latina teens have taken part. They are all in school or have graduated. Many have gone on to college. Most importantly, not one of our teens has completed suicide. Our takeaway for you today is that any strategies developed to help at-risk first responders must incorporate the language and culture of the first responders. This needs to, be, needs to include awareness and education and services that they can access. Thank you very much. Thank you. Press your magic button. Here you go. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Anitha Ayer. Thank you, Council Member Ayala and, com uh, and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction for the opportunity to provide testimony regarding the emotional issue, important issue of mental health services and supports for first responders. Vibrant Emotional Health, formerly known as the Mental Health Association of New York City, has provided direct services, public education, and advocacy services to New York City for over 50 years, and throughout its history has been engaged in suicide prevention activities for vulnerable populations. Vibrant currently administers the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which serves nearly two million people every year. Vibrant also partners with the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC, and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to operate NYC Well, the city's multilingual mental health substance use and crisis intervention service, which is available to all New Yorkers via phone, text, and chat 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As research demonstrates, people in certain professions, such as law enforcement officers and other first responders, are at increased risk for suicide and may struggle without accessing the supports necessary to address their mental health and emotional needs. First responders experience unique stressors associated with their work, including exposure to traumatic events they might witness in the community, such as death or severe injury of others, as well as the stress associated with risks to their own personal safety within the context of their work. They may work frequent shifts, often with long hours, and may work overnight or during other off hours, which may decrease their opportunities for adequate sleep and decompression time after their work hours. An illustration of the effects of these dynamics was reported in a 2016 study, which found that 75% of police officers surveyed reported having experienced at least one work-related traumatic event, but fewer than half of those affected reported the effects of this experience in their workplaces. Behavioral health disorders such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and substance misuse have been demonstrated to be higher among first responders than the general population, and to increase among police officers following exposure to traumatic events, including natural disasters such as Hurricane Katrina, or terrorist attacks such as those that occurred on 9-11. In addition, suicidal ideation and suicide attempts have been demonstrated to be higher than the general population in an array of studies of po police officers for example, a literature review published in 2016 found that 25% of female officers experienced suicidal ideation or made an attempt, while the corresponding rate for male officers was just over 23%. Research has also identified a number of risk factors associated with behavioral health conditions and suicidal ideation or attempts, including but not limited to high levels of job-related stress or burnout while on the job, significant mental or physical distress prior to active duty, exposure to work-related traumatic events, including those directly experienced by responders, such as physical injury, 
exposure to long work hours while exposed to traumatic events without adequate time off to decompress, and personal challenges such as relationship difficulties or financial hardship. Research has additionally demonstrated an increased risk of having a suicide plan, as well as increased rates of suicide attempts, if one is a first responder. These risk factors, coupled with job-related access to firearms, are of significant concern and point to the critical need to provide evidence-based interventions to reduce the rate of suicide attempts among this population. Some of the non-clinical interventions that have been demonstrated to be effective to reduce suicidal ideation among first responders include psychological first aid training, which is a training that is intended to help people who have experienced disasters or other traumatic emergency events, peer support programs, and ensuring adequate support in stressful work environments and protection from overwork, while encouraging and supporting help-seeking behavior. There are effective clinical treatments for depression, anxiety disorders, substance misuse, and post-traumatic stress disorder, all of which contribute to increased suicidal risk among first responders. But in order to connect first responders to treatment, it is critically important to identify those who may be struggling with clinically significant symptoms and suicidal ideation. For this reason, the value of screening first responders on a routine basis for psychological distress, including suicidal ideation, cannot be understated. Public education must also be provided to ensure that police officers can recognize the signs that their partners in law enforcement may be experiencing emotional distress, have peer-level conversations to provide appropriate support, and promote help-seeking, and can access treatment services and other supports that can reduce the risk of suicide. All first responders should be made aware of NYC Well and the 24-7 availability of its counselors to provide support, safety planning, and connection to treatment services, including to mobile crisis response and emergency intervention when indicated. In the wake of the recent increase of suicides among New York City police officers, Vibrant has partnered with Thrive NYC and the NYPD to provide suicide prevention trainings to police personnel during roll call. And as of the date of this hearing, has provided 72 hearings with the intention of providing training to every police precinct in the city before the end of November. The trainings provide information about how to recognize the risk factors for suicide, how to identify warning signs that someone may be thinking about or planning suicide, how to engage with someone safely to help support them and help them connect with resources and information about resources, including those that are available internally within the NYPD and those that are available externally, including NYC Well, which can serve as a confidential source of support and crisis intervention to first responders and all other NYPD personnel. As we are still reviewing the details of the proposed legislation that would require NYPD to provide mental health services and information to officers, we cannot comment specifically on it. However, Vibrant does generally support the provision of additional mental health resources for the New York City Police Department. Additionally, Vibrant supports the proposed re resolution to declare the third week of May of each year to be recognized as First Responder Mental Health Awareness Week. Vibrant looks forward to continued partnership with the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC and with the NYPD to reduce the impact of suicide among New York City's first responder communities. We are also gl grateful to the New York City Council for its leadership in supporting the mental and emotional well-being of first responders and all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> and I want to go to John uh, for a few questions. Uh, can you just speak to what are the advantages of members of service um, uh, going to PAPA, which provides services obviously outside of the department. And I want to thank you because I actually spoke to an officer um, the night of uh, the suicide uh, around the corner from my house. And uh, he spoke of uh, after 9-11 him coming and utilizing services at PAPA and he really um, thought PAPA was a, a great route to go for officers due to his experience. I want to thank you and PAPA for the work that you do. And can you just speak to um, uh, why peer-led uh, counseling is very important and, and what are the advantages of having your organization really at the front line and what is your thoughts around the clinicians? Okay, thank you. Uh, one is the peer-based, and again, the peer connected with the volunteer is what gets it. Uh, when we go out and meet with one of the officers, the first thing we have to do is try to connect with them. And now they're looking at us saying, All right, why are you doing this? Why are you here? Why are you helping me? 
Uh, and they're thinking, well, do you have a nice cushiony job at 1PP? You got your weekends off? Just the opposite. These are cops that want to help somebody. So when they go out and they explain to them that, no, I'm here on my time, and you matter to me, that's what starts to break down the wall. Police culture as a whole is resistant to mental health. You know, the police are the helpers. They don't need the help. And as we know, and I know through my career, uh, there's times where you do need to get some help. And with that, we just afford them the comfortability. And, you know, in conjunction with everything else we're able to do for them, it makes it a much more comfortable route for them to take to get help. Can you speak to your staffing? So how much full or part-time staff do you have and how many volunteers? We have 200 volunteers that man the active helpline. We also have an additional 80 that work on the, retire, re, the retiree line. Uh, the retiree line is manned just by retirees. The active has a majority of active cops that, that man it. Uh, running the office in the staff, there's an admin person, I have a clinical person, we have a, uh, a bookkeeper, and we also have a cop assigned to us that takes care of all the scheduling on the lines and making sure it's programmed. We put a new cop on every 24 hours, so each cop that takes that line, they're, they're committed to it for 24 hours, any calls that come in. And uh, how many of, uh, members of service did you service last year again? Roughly about 400, 405 uh, on the active line and another 100 plus on the retiree line. Everything ranging from a cop just needed to vent to we needed to get them into a mental health facility uh, forthwith. And, and how do you do outreach? Can you just speak to that? We, we do outreaches, and again, it's a, to a compliment to the police department because they allow us access to the police offices. Uh, we were able to get up to the range and, again, talk to just about 20,000 cops. Uh, we do outreaches when the cadets or when the recruits come into the academy. We get a period of time to talk to them. We also speak to the officers as they get promoted. We go to the promotion ceremonies for sergeants, lieutenants, and captains, and we're able to, to reach them that way. And can you speak to what, what have been some of the limitations you've been faced with? And how can the council be helpful in ensuring that your organization is supported? Okay. We're, we're firm believers, and we've been, been talking about this for years, doing the checkup once a year with them. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to see that happen. Uh, and then thinking about how it would be implemented, uh, if the department does it, the feel is that the police officer is going to put down what the answer is that the department wants to hear. Uh, if we do it in another way where it's done outside, if somebody like Popper or another organization steps in and takes that role, that'll help us get more honest answers. And uh, what's your budget annually? Are you provided with the budget or is all of We're, we're a not-for-profit, so we, we work on that. Uh, we get uh, an amount from the police relief fund, which gives us our main operating money. We also get funds through the CMC, or New York Cares now, I think it's, it's named. So we get an annual budget on, on the police relief fund of about 400,000. Uh, we get it from the CMC, about another 300,000 to help us operate. Um, when again, when we were here initially back in 96, the city council came up with the money to help us get started. Uh, that has since gone away. How much uh, but we have that? other programs we're looking to do. When, when it was brought up when you were talking with the panel before, we do go out after critical incidents. We also get notified, as EAU would. Uh, we go out, and what we do is follow up afterwards, and we get them all in for a debriefing. So we just don't take the, the person that was involved in the shooting. We make sure we get the people that were there and just witness the horrific scene. Those officers are brought in. We have a mental health professional and peers, and they go through a formal debriefing where they get to talk about the incident. Uh, we know that that can help us take it out of packing it down and just off to the next job and allow them to put it somewhere in a safer compartment. And if needed, we can hook them up with mental health services. And you said, um, the, well, at least it was a, uh, not you, but I think in the last panel, uh, there were 26 suicides in 1995. 94 and 95. Um, over the two um, are you seeing much, are you seeing a different environment now from um, then, or are you hearing or seeing more pressures yeah. uh, on members of service now, or, or has this been very similar, or is this a similar story to 1994? You know, th this is different because the way they came in the cluster. 
that, that was something different. And it's all over the place as far as amount of years on the job and, and you know, how close they were to retirement and, and their, their commands. So that's kind of difficult for us to even put a, a finger on. Uh, when we get cops coming through, do we see uh, uh, stresses from policing today? Absolutely. Um, they'll come in and be very frustrated that they, they don't have an outlet. They, they have to put up with a lot now. And that, I think, would be creating some of the calls we've received. Uh, I don't know about the suicides, what the, the contributing factors were there, but from our number of calls we get, we get some that are just dealing with job stress. And has there been an increase of fluctuation in calls? Or yes. They have, Based on can you go from last year to this year, um, how m do, if you have the numbers? Yeah, th this year, right now, to date, we're up to about what our call volume was last year in the entire year. Part of that is because of the outreach. When we do outreaches, our call volume goes up. When we're able to get out there, and, and we suggest and we try to do it as much as we can, we'd like to be out there as often as we can because the constant reminder is helpful. You know, when we have cops and we're sitting in a group and they're doing okay today and they're not listening and they're, you know, maybe looking at a paper or, or on a cell phone as we're, we're talking, uh, we get it, they're okay today, but six months from now things change and now they're looking for that help and they don't know where to go. So by being out there constantly, and I know we've done it where we'll go out and EAU will go out and it'll be a joint effort, uh, but our, our concerns with that is that we don't want to be put in the same boat as the department. The reason we're so successful is because we're separate from the department. Uh, and with that, the department does, uh, does allow us to operate. Uh, we know there's a line there that we, either of us won't cross, but they allow us to do a lot without interfering and wanting to know what's going on. We give them zero information on the police officers that call and that, that just get a referral. It's a little more detailed when it's somebody that we have to put out of service, which means removing weapons. And PD refers people to you or no? Uh, from what I've heard, yes. Some people have said that, that their unit has referred uh, over to us. All right, thank you for, uh, for the work you do. Uh, really appreciate it, and uh, we look forward to working and being helpful. Uh, and, and offline, we should uh, have a meeting or something of that nature, but Papa should start thinking about ways the council could be helpful, uh, as we were back in 94, uh, because we want to stem this uh, epidemic. So thank you for the work you do, and well, all the, all the volunteers much. and your staff. Thank you. Thank Any you. questions from my colleagues? Diana Ayala. Ayala. Yes. Question for Lisa. Does, N does NYC well have uh, the ability to track how many first responders are calling into the system? Um, so NYC well can track uh, calls from first responders so long as they identify themselves as first responders when they reach out to us. Do many people disclose that they're first responders? Um, based on the calls that we've received where individuals have disclosed that they are a first responder police officer or otherwise, um, it's a very small number. Um, we can certainly get back to you with specific data around that. Okay. Um, and I have a question regarding some of the data that you uh, put in your report. So it says that there was, a li there was literature published in 2016 that found that 25% of female officers experienced uh, suicidal ideation while only 23% um, of male officers experienced it. Um, yet the trend um, is saying that, you know, well, we were seeing a higher trend of, of men that are committing suicide. What, what is it, what do, you, what do you think is the discrepancy there? So there's generally a discrepancy um, in terms of ideation versus attempts between men and women in the general population. Um, this study was, um, the study I cited was from Stanley. Um, and the reference is in the packet I, I provided. Um, so th it's, uh, its focus, it describes ideation or made an attempt um, versus the 25 female suicide officers who also, um, the report is about ideation or made an attempt. Um, I don't have any further details about what that discrepancy could be, but in the general population as well, there is um, a higher proportion of ideation among female um, females and a higher amount of attempts among men. Yeah, I'd be interested in finding out what, what the difference is, because if more women are, are considering it, but more men are actually completing it, um, then, you know, something, there's something really off about that, uh, off-putting to me, so I would like to learn more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, last panel.
Oren Barze, Local 2507, FDNY EMS. Kevon Harper, Friends of Firefighters, Regina Wilson, Vulcan Society, Eric Knudsen, Friends of Firefighters, yeah. Amy Andrix, Makata. Eric Knudsen, Lieutenant, had to leave. He had to report for work. And okay. Kevon Harper also had to go to the firehouse. So okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. It's an honor. Sure. Benjamin Shear. Oh, you're here. Okay, great. National Association of Social Workers, NYC chapter. Regina Wilson, Vulcan Society. Amy Andrix, Makata, Oren Barze. You may begin. Good afternoon, council members. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this vital issue that many first responders are dealing with. My name is Owen Barzale, president of the FDNY EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors union. FDNY EMTs and paramedics are highly trained medical personnel whose work is an extension of a physician performed on the streets of our city. This happens during the heat of summer, in the freezing temperatures of a blizzard, in the highest crime ridden neighborhoods. In the course of a shift, an EMT, paramedic, or any first responder may find a, a teen laying in a pool of his own blood after being shot. An EMT, paramedic, or any first responder may be called to the scene of a baby in cardiac arrest. He or she will be summoned to revive a drug addict who stopped breathing. All this along with dealing with the difficult environments of high patient acuity, all while operating a five-ton ambulance, lights and siren, through the most congested streets in the nation. Our members are exposed to violence, trauma, child, elder abuse, burned victims, and, and deaths are seen on a daily basis. The routine daily exposure to the above is medically proven to cause mental illness. The working conditions for the FDNY EMS professionals are, to say the least, less than ideal. There's never enough funding to field an appropriate number of ambulances to meet the ever-increasing call volume. There is never enough staffing to ensure there are enough people to share the workload, making mandatory overtime a daily fact of life. The pay is far too low for the unpredictable situations that routinely define a normal day at work. The stresses of high call volumes, overtime, shift work, abuse of the 911 system, unstable and dynamic working conditions, Maintaining skills proficiency, managing protocol changes coupled with a draconian discipline system that treats the most minor infractions as major felonies has resulted in among all emergency services workers, EMTs, paramedics, and other, other first responders, the highest rate of PTSD. PTSD is rarely a standalone issue. Other behavioral health disorders, such as addictions and depressions, are often associated with PTSD. These have direct relations with one another, making them co-occurring issues. For EMTs and paramedics, this can manifest into many different ways, including a combination of a substance abuse and depression. For instance, an EMT or a paramedic who is dealing with depression may use alcohol to self-medicate. These combinations can result in destructive behavior, disruptions on the job, and translate into a divorce rate of 40%. The department offers EMTs and paramedics help through our counseling service unit. They, while making a valiant effort, are handcuffed by the department policy. The practitioners that staff CSU are unable to grant time away from the job. As of July this year, the FDNY Counseling Service Unit has a psychologist on staff. However, our members are seen by a clinician 
leaving them unable to file claims. Thus, co workers' compensations will not accept a claim made by one of my members. If a member needs time to decompress, he must use his own leave balances. If he needs advanced care, he must file a claim with his insurance company. That claim is often denied, leaving the member no choice but to return to full duty and re-enter the cycle that led to his PTSD in the first place. I look forward to working with this committee on improving the mental health of all first responders. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your work. Good afternoon to the chair and council members. Um, my name is Regina Wilson, and I am the immediate past president of the Volk Society, a New York City firefighter in Brooklyn, New York, and a member of the FDNY ceremonial unit. The Volk Society is a African-American affinity group which is comprised of uniformed and civilian employees of the FDNY. Our organization has been in existence for 79 years and has played a vital role in some of the critical changes made in the fire department in, regard, in regards to fair and equitable treatment for women and people of color. Our organization mission is to support, educate, and serve our, and serve our members in our community. I am here today to address the issues of preventing suicide and promoting mental health for first responders. A study which was conducted by the Rudderman Foundation and several articles written by Forbes, Fire Engineering, and Fire Rescue One reported that most firefighters commit suicide in 2017 than they died of line of duty. In fact, the study found that 103 firefighters and 140 police officers died by suicide in 2017 compared to 93 firefighters and 129 officers' line of duty deaths. It is reported that very little has been done to address PTSD, anxiety, and depression in responders, even though they are five times more likely than civilians to suffer from these symptoms. First responders are constantly exposed to death and destruction, and it can, can cause an avert toll in the long run. As a member of the ceremonial unit, we are exposed to continuous amounts of funerals, plaque dedication, street renamings, and memorial service. As you know, the, the fire department just buried um, more than 200 of its World Trade Center um, illnesses, firefighters. So we're still, we actually have a World Trade Center related illness um, funeral this week. As a member, oh, sorry, this, re this elite unit is a very backbone of providing strength and comfort to our members in the department who are dealing with the most traumatic parts of their lives and their family lives. We cannot overlook the need to focus on helping people who spend every day and sometimes every work waking moment on all that they have to help others. Unfortunately, a lot of the suicides for first responders go unreported and not addressed by the media or press as much as line of duty deaths. I believe it creates a large difference in the way first responders who died are treated. It is also unfortunate that a lot of departments do not have an adequate suicide prevention program that helps to really focus on the treatment of people dealing with depression and suicidal thoughts. These programs should also address the issue of proper mental health services and how each community and gender deals with mental issues, mental health issues. As an example, in the African American community, it has always been taboo to talk about seeing a psychiatrist or a therapist or speaking to any type of mental health professional at all. You are seen as crazy, unmanageable, and to, our, to your family and friends just different. It is important to help to break the stigma and provide a safe space and atmosphere for those who have grown up believing that getting help is for losers. As a remedy for the issue to the uncomfortability and relatability in speaking with mental health issues for women and people of color, I suggest peer-to-peer -peer counseling or assistance with people who look like them. Begin with a diverse mental health counsel unit and continue mental checkups. The department the department begins to take the stigma out of the toughness we think that we should have as firefighters and begin to feel comfortable to speak about how we feel with our own peers. 
Providing a more awareness training for officers in the department will help officers to identify the signs of suicide and depression, and not just when they're going through flips, which is in the beginning of their career. And begin to have the conversations with the members to help them to see that it's okay to get help. We need more in-depth training now to deal with, with situations that have been masked for so many years. We ask today to provide the funding and help to help to the help we need as first responders to continue to serve the city we love. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Richards, Chair Ayala, Chair Borelli, and the rest of the City Council, thank you for allowing the National Association of Social Workers, New York City Chapter, to present testimony on INT 1704. My name is Ben Scher, and I am the president of NESW NYC Board of Directors and a licensed master social worker. The executive director of NASW NYC, Dr. Claire Green Ford, sends her regrets as she as well could not be here today. Prior to my current position, I spent 21 years working at one of the largest providers of mental health services in metropolitan New York City. 10 of these years were spent in direct oversight of programs serving New Yorkers with serious mental illness. I have been a trainer and consultant on mental health symptoms, mental health risk factors, and resources for people for 25 years. I want to begin my testimony by offering my deepest condolences to the families and colleagues of police officers who recently lost people to suicide. Most of my interactions with first responders and the police has been when I was involved in emotionally disturbed persons' calls for the clients I served. These interactions were often not easy for all of the parties involved and demonstrated the inherent stress involved in being a metropolitan police officer. In all occasions, I found the work of building relationships with local police precincts and officers assigned to cover the programs I supervised made the outcome of these calls most effective. These relationships gave me the opportunity to, within the bounds of confidentiality, reach out to officers I knew and elicit their support when our residents were troubled or beginning to destabilize. In preparing my testimony for this hearing, it was the concept of relationship building that stood out for me in helping to address the needs of police officers and other first responders in mental health information training and support resources. Though our society has come a long way, there is still much stigma and misunderstanding about mental illness. It is much easier for a person to say they are experiencing a mental condition than depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, or the symptoms of suicidality. I believe the same stigma and even shame about mental illness is increased in the New York City police force and in first responders, where officers are trained to be in control and having problems is a sign of weakness. Officers are trained to be tough and to bear through hard times. Emotions are suppressed and to show signs of sadness, worry, stress, or trauma are to be marginalized and ignored. While we typically think of first responders when in the midst of crisis, we at the times forget when the crisis subsides when the story is no longer trending, there are those who are impacted beyond the letter's Twitter feed. There are those who go from one emergency to another, hardly having time to process one traumatic event before responding to the next. We overlook the fact that those are who are one day witness the despair of a family who lost their child to drugs, the devastation of the person who lost their home to a fire, or have to deal with the ongoing mental and emotional toll years after tragedies such as what our first responders, their loved ones, and all of those who were impacted by the terrorist attacks on 9-11 live with every day. According to Asa, Asa Don, Dr. Asa Don Brown, who is also a first responder uh, on psychology today, there's ample evidence to suggest that many first responders deny or resist seeking mental health care due to longstanding stigmatization. Research literature suggests that for many, there is an underlying fear of being subjected to ridicule, prejudice, discrimination, and labeling. In fact, in 2016, the Badge of Life, a police suicide prevention program, revealed that nearly 108 law enforcement officers across the country took their own lives. According to the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance, an estimated 113 firefighters and paramedics took their own lives in 2015. The statistics are real. The untimely death of firefighters, police officers, correction officers, probation officers, EMTs, and countless other first responders, responders is present. As the largest professional body of social workers, we beg you to consider the barriers and organizational culture within our first responder organizations that may reinforce these stereotypes and strengthen a system of silence. One in five people in America will experience a mental health condition in their lifetime. First responders are not immune to this statistic. 
Therefore, I applaud the City Council for taking the steps to prevent suicide and address the mental health concerns of first responders. At the same time, NASW cautions the Council to be sensitive to the cultural needs and experiences of first responders as they develop this legislation. Social workers, through their code of ethics, are required to provide culturally sensitive services to populations that have different experiences. Working with first responders would be part of building that cultural awareness. We implore you to use every resource at your disposal to support our first responders. We ask that training on destigmatizing treatment and help is done for everyone in every rank. We ask that this is ongoing and not a one-time check-off box as training done. We ask that comprehensive services and options are provided and accessible to first responders both in and outside of their agencies. We ask that these services and supports are also extended to their families because they sacrifice for us too. Thus, the important aspect of relation building and understanding culture will be key in developing legislation for INT 1704. Social workers, the nation's largest provider of mental health services, are uniquely poised to support this work. Social workers are trained in the person environment inspected where perspective we are expected to understand the person in the context of the psychosocial, behavioral, familial, economic, education, political, spiritual, and other forces that may be affecting their lives. NASW NYC stands ready to help work with the City Council to develop models of care and educational resources grounded in its expertise in mental health while working within the understanding of a population that needs time, support, patient understanding to make these interventions successful. NASW NYC has over 5,000 members in a national organization that counts 120,000 social workers at its core. We want to support all efforts to address the risk of suicide and mental health issues amongst first responders, and we understand the assessment and care by which this must be done. We stand ready to be a resource from development to implementation of this legislation. Thank you for allowing us to testify today. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, and let me just ask the um, uh, EM EMTs and obviously the Vulcan Society first. Um, so I mean, a lot, the huge emphasis obviously was put on PD today because of the, the rash of, of deaths by suicide. Um, would you support companion bills that look very similar to this? Do you support clinicians? Are you saying the services are not technically there the way FDNY framed it today? Um, so can you just speak to that? You wanna? Well, yeah. For you. Uh, we definitely need more than clinicians. Uh, they're there just to listen, but they, they doesn't go any further than that. So for your members, it looks different. It looks different. It, it certainly is different for my members. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and what would you want done if that's the case? Well, the, the first biggest issue that we have is the stigma and the confidentiality. Uh, and are people taken off the jobs or is there a perception of that or how does that look for? Well, if, if you are diagnosed, there is the risk of you being sidelined. Uh, you're restricted and then that that makes it even worse because now you're gonna get a pay cut. So w when you disclose that you need some time off, they will do it for you. But um, when you go on a, uh, on a light duty position or modified duty position, you're now getting a pay cut, which will add to your stress. And how often would you say that happens? Uh, our members are very rarely uh, come forward saying that they have this problem due to those, due to those uh, issues that I just mentioned. And for the Vulcan Society, if you could speak. Um, we believe that um, the CSU unit has provided uh, a lot of great um, accessibility to uh, talk to the counselors, but um, I think our main issue is that there's not enough counselors. Um, I think CSU spoke about going around to all the different firehouses, but there's over 200 firehouses, and they don't even have that many counselors. So you cannot provide that type of service that they speak of when you have lack of staffing. Especially peer-to-peer -peer counselors, they just started this year to ramp it up after the Volk Society brought it to their attention. And we also wanted to make sure that we reiterated to them that there is a need of people of color to be in these units. Because if you want people to have a level of comfort and you want them to have a, le a level of understanding, you have to have people in there that looks like them, that can relate to them, 
that understands their history, their past, and can be more relatable to the things that they're doing. So um, for, um, I think, our issues are different. I feel that EMS is always treated a lot different than fire, and the amount of resources that we get are so far less for EMS and as well for the fire inspector. So I think a revamp and in a, in a, in a equality for all of us as if we're considered family has to be made and made sure that we're all receiving the same level of care and also the firefighters themselves are not coming as forward in the rates that they could as well because they don't they don't feel like they are getting the adequate amount of care that they need because they're not it's not something that's always talked about and it's not an ongoing and pervasive issue that we're dealing with every day in a firehouse. So we're looking for that type of treatment because we have a lot of um, issues dealing with, um, as Orin, Orin talked about, in reference to domestic violence and um, drug abuse and um, DWIs and alcohol abuse going on. Thank you. And NASW, could you just speak to, do you support the goals of the bills, the bill that we introduced today, do you Absolutely. think it's a step in the right direction? Absolutely, I think that uh, NSW would completely support, actually completely supports this bill and would do anything we can in our resources to help support it. And if I just have one minute, I do want to uh, address Council Ayea's um, questions earlier about suicide. Um, you are absolutely 100% correct about the fact that, you know, men are less socialized to talk about their problems than women are. Um, one of the other reasons why there are more completed suicides amongst men is because men use more lethal means to uh, end their lives. So there's more likely, unfortunately, to be the side effect of death as a result of that, whereas women have used more means that might not result in ultimate uh, demise. So I just wanted you to know that, so thank you. So that means that they, they may have attempted, but just were not successful because of the way that they attempted. Right. Or that men may have been, you know, may have s sort of had the same issues, but because they're more likely to use a lethal means to kill themselves, the result is that they end up dying. I appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you. Can oh, I, oh, sorry. Sorry, I have one more question. Can I just well, add something to what Regina said? Uh, one, I thank you for bringing some stuff to light. Just to show you the disparity that she's talking about, while on the fire side, there's multiple firefighters on the counseling service unit, there's only one paramedic assigned to the EMS side. Um, the department talk about our members getting debriefed after critical incidents. That's not necessarily true. Um, unless you're asking for it, you're not getting it. So if you're walking out with a burnt child who's not breathing, unless you're asking for somebody to talk to, it's not necessarily always there for you. Um, Wait, is that, is that just for EMTs or is that also for, are you witnessing that in the fire department? It's I'm, not wi I'm witnessing it, and I'm sorry, Regina, I'm witnessing it with my members. Your members, so I'm, soon, okay. As soon as you, you're done with that patient, you're back in service. Gotcha. So I, I, and that was the kind of something that I, you know, was talking to, um, to my colleagues about is that I, I, I was very impressed, highly impressed with the level of service that the fire department and the services they offer their members. However, it's quite clear that there's a discrepancy in the level, that level of service kind of being more uniformed policy that stretches across all of the, uh, the different agencies um, and categories. So. I think that that's something that we, we should definitely uh, look into and maybe have a conversation with the administration about because there's no reason why one, you know, th there should be a disparity in the way that services are being provided, especially if we're seeing success in the fire department, then we shouldn't be, you know, recreating the wheel. We should be replicating some, you know, of those practices. But I, I you know, I apologize that we, I had a question about, you know, uh, the EMTs and it just slipped my mind. But you're absolutely right. You should be, you know, um, an equal part of that conversation and we will follow up. Uh, with FDNY and with the administration about that. And this is in no way, shape or form taking a shot at anybody that no, works no, at the I, counseling I service. They it's do a not. great job, but no, there, no. Is, there is a disparity of, 
of treatment of that. Yeah, but I, that's why I think it would be that disparity would kind of, you know, disappear if we had a uniform policy for how we provide mental health services to all of our first responders, and that should look. I mean, obviously there are differences in the department, right? Um, that that would sway it a different way, but I think that there are ways that we could do this that looks a little bit it, that resembles, you know, what uh, the other departments are doing. But I thank you so much for coming here and to testify today. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you so much for coming. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, my councils for the great work that they did, Casey Addison, Daniel Addis, for the work that they did uh, as well for this hearing. We look forward to passing these bills and working with the administration and FDNY and NYPD and uh, obviously our EMT buddies to make sure that uh, this is a uniform process, and I think you made a, a, a great point that it shouldn't look different, that everybody should get the same services. So thank you so much. Thank you all for coming out. This hearing is now closed.